all talking a little bit about the, the scene, and the yes, sir. scene that being the scene outside of my ways. Objectively, um, the information that you receive from all sources um, certainly appears that Ross was upset and emotional and screaming and pacing around and trying to make phone calls there at the scene. That's what it appeared like, that he was actually on the phone. And you would agree that uh, there was also something very uh, significant that occurred to Ross right there on the scene while he was going through this emotional outburst. I'm sorry. Something very significant happened to Ross during the very time he was going through this emotional outburst on the scene. And what are you talking about, sir? Can you think of anything that happened to him? Significant. Are you talking before the police or after the police interaction? I'm talking about the fact that Ross was handcuffed and detained placed in the back of the police cruiser right at the time where we're having this outburst that we all hear on the, on the video. Yes. And you certainly would agree that um, getting handcuffed and uh, placed in a police cruiser can be a, uh, can create an attitude adjustment? Yes. It can be a very sobering thing. It can be. Um, and here, um, apparently from what we've heard and in your investigation, Ross was so out of control at the scene that he had to be detained. Yes. Okay. He actually had to be removed from the scene. He had to be taken from, from where he was there near his car and driven, handcuffed, some hundred feet away. Correct. But you would agree that once they handcuffed him and he was placed in a car and, and, and driven from the scene a little bit, we go from this um, emotional state to a very sobering state. I would agree. And, and, and isn't that what... Um, isn't that what police want and, and expect when they're dealing with someone on the scene who's disruptive? It is. Okay. You want to get their attention. Correct. Okay. A lot of times you use the word detained instead of the word arrested, right? True. Okay. And you can detain people for lots of reasons. Is that fair to say? Yes. And what we've heard in this case and from your investigation, what you understand is he was detained because he was disruptive. Correct. And it worked. It got him under control. He was under control of the car. Okay. Now, we, um, we heard a good bit of testimony already about um, Ross being in the cruiser away from, the, uh, away from the, his car and away from the trooper's body. Uh, and we can see some of that and some of the pictures that we've gotten in the video. Um, but you were actually there on the scene. I was. Okay. And it's fair to say that um, the cruiser was probably 100 feet away or more. Okay. Good estimate. Okay. And it's also true that Piper's cruiser was facing away from the scene where Ross's vehicle and Cooper were. That's also true. I can't, I'm sorry, I couldn't see. I get that a lot. And um, if, if Piper's cruiser was facing forward and Ross were seated in the back seat, you would agree that he would be looking, if he looked straight ahead, he would be looking away from or in the opposite direction of where his truck was and where Cooper's body was. That's correct. You know through your investigation what we've seen that Ross <coughs> turned around to look out the back window. Right? Correct. While he was handcuffed, while he was in the cruiser some hundred feet away. Yes, sir. And looking out the back window was looking in the direction of where the truck and his child were, right? That is correct.
And you don't see anything suspicious about that, do you? Suspicious as? Well, isn't that a natural reaction? If you are driven away from the scene where your, your, your child is deceased, <coughs> wouldn't it be a natural reaction to turn around and try to, try to see what was going on? Possibly. But wouldn't it have been more remarkable if he just sat straight forward and never turned around? No, I think that would have been... That would have been weird, wouldn't it? No. no. I don't think so. So moments after he's discovered the, uh, the deceased body of this child, he's cuffed, driven from the scene. Do you think it would have been a more normal response for him just to sit there looking forward instead of turning around, trying to see what was going on? I do, because if he's in shock, if he just had a major emotional moment, the death of your child. I, I think a catonic state where you're sitting there just staring ahead would be normal. Okay. So it should have been staring straight ahead. I'm saying I'm not going to get comfortable with this one. I'm done, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. You, um, you identified an exhibit this morning, 631, and just there's a lot of this, so just to refresh your recollection, you're about to know. Yes, sir. Uh, you know what that is? Yep, it is a whisper. Um, and what, uh, if you would just remind the jury, is this a whisper that he posted, or is this one that he responded to? This is one he responded to. Okay. Yes, sir. And you agree, and we went over it kind of fast in your direct. And you agree the whisper, which was uh, which was posted, said, having an extremely boring and slow day, can anyone help the time go by faster? Right? Yes, sir. 20-year-old okay. female. Okay. Or 20. 20 up. 20 up. And during the, uh, during the exchange, um, you would agree that uh, at 11, 17, in the morning, let's make sure I've got my time right. I'm talking about the very bottom right there. You're talking about Eve Alton? Uh huh. Yep. 11:17 a.m. Right. So this is a whisper that he responds to on that day. Yes, sir. That very morning. Correct. At 11:17 in the morning, uh, during this whisper, um, you agree. Uh, Ross indicates, "Well, I have a son." That Joker decided that, "Hey, I'm going to get up early." Correct? Correct. And at some point, the other individual says, well, how old is he? Ross says, two. She says, oh, what a great age. And Ross says, he's awesome. Right? Yeah, the last one says he's awesome. That's at 1117 that very morning. Correct. So you would agree that um, the expression, uh, he's awesome, By Ross, you would agree that that is inconsistent with a uh, with, with malice or hatred for the individual he's talking about. Yes, and that whisper, correct. Okay. <clears throat> kind of seems like he's just absolutely clueless that this is out there in the car, doesn't it? Or it looks like, doesn't it? Or it could be a reminder that Cooper's out there in the car as he's talking about his son. It could go either way, sir. Could go either way. Your way is that that should have reminded him that he forgot to drop Cooper off? Yes. And then the other way would be that guy over there was absolutely clueless that his child was out in the car. That's I the believe, other way, right? I believe it should be a reminder that your son's out in the car. Is it your belief then that he had just forgotten that he had a child altogether? No. As part of this investigation, you uh, you asked for some assistance from the FBI. I did. Okay. And did you have uh, did you share information with them? I did. All right. You had meetings with them and whatnot. I did. All right. And did they provide uh, information back to you? They did. All right. Did they provide you with a binder? They did. Okay. 
What was in that binder? Articles. Okay. What kind of articles? Judge, I'm going to object to relevance at this point. We've already discussed this issue before, and it, this is not relevant. It's part of his investigation. He said that uh, he dealt with the FBI on the case, gave them information, they had meetings together. This is part of his investigation. Doesn't make it admissible, doesn't make it uh, not hearsay, Judge. I'm going to have an objection. <clears throat> what kind of articles were in that binder? There are articles from David Diamond um, concerning um, different cases that he's testified on. Um, I believe it was Kids in Cars. Um, and forgive me if I'm saying it wrong, but it's a national organization that tracks um, kids in cars, um, deaths of kids in cars. Okay. And, and I think I'll leave it at that. All right. And how big was the binder? It was, it was thick. More than an inch? Yes. Two inches? It's good more than an inch. So. Okay. Right. And did you read the articles in there? I did. Okay. You said some of the articles were written by David Diamond? Either about or mm -hmm. by um, Dr. Diamond. Okay. And you know that Dr. Diamond is involved in this case? I do. Okay. And in any of the articles, did you learn that he is a person that uh, studies uh, studies the, uh, the very phenomenon of parents forgetting their children in cars? I do. What point in time did you get that binder? Would have been after November 2015. And did the articles in those binder in those binders that you reviewed as part of your investigation, did it discuss other cases where children were forgotten in cars? Yes. Okay. You testified um, on direct that you smelled an odor in Ross's truck. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Now, let's, um, let's start with the scene. Okay. Um, on the scene, did you get inside of the truck? I don't recall putting my head inside the truck. I got up next to the truck while on the scene, though. Okay. You got up next to it? I got up next to the open door, yes, sir. All right. Did you put your head in there? I don't recall. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 45 and 46. You agree that little Cooper was um, only about 36 inches away from the, uh, the door frame? Yes, sir. Where were you standing? I don't recall exactly where I was standing, but I had come up around Cooper um, to kind of peer in the car to see the configuration of the car and where everything was inside the car. Yeah. And you would agree that we're talking about uh, a very small space, a very small area between the open door and where Cooper's covered up. Agreed. And you didn't smell anything on the scene? No, sir. <clears throat> you, um, you later Got inside the car, what, four hours, six hours later? Yeah, later on that night. Later that night? Yes, sir. Okay, the search warrant was at 1020. That would have been roughly six hours later? Roughly. And at that point in time when you saw it, when you got in the car, the car was in the evidence shed? It was. And you're aware that the car had been out there on the scene for more than an hour? Yes, sir with the door open? Correct. And the air conditioner running? Correct. And you didn't smell anything then? You didn't smell anything then? You're saying then on scene? Mm-hmm. No, I didn't smell anything on scene. All right. Well, then you come back to the shed, and you, uh, you originally testified back in 2014 there was a foul odor 
It smelled like de decomposition of death. Right? And you were talking about the car when it was in the shed, right? That's correct. But yesterday when you testified, you sort of, you, you, you kind of backed off that a little bit. You said, well, it's not really decomposition like, like scientifically, like a medical examiner would say decomposition or something of that nature. That's correct. And I'll explain that. When we go to a scene and you smell death, it's used interchangeably. Not the correct way to use it, because a decomp, you know, deals with the actual body breaking down. But I would use it and say, I smell decomp or I smell death. Okay. Your boss at that time was Lieutenant Farrell. It was. And you're aware that Lieutenant Farrell uh, indicated that he smelled, he smelled some sort of odor associated with death before he even stuck his head in the car. Correct. Well, he was right here at the scene. Lieutenant Farrell smelled gases coming off the body. I'm not aware of his testimony. Right. You didn't smell gases coming off the body? I didn't smell anything on the scene. Okay. All right. And during your investigation, you learned that there were lots of responders right there in the same position that Lieutenant Farrell was, correct? Correct. Well, and know that there was, um, and we have a crime scene log if, we need, if you need to refer to it, but uh, just a couple of people that I want to go over. Uh, we know that uh, there was a crime scene investigator, Shumpert. True. And, and um, you, you know through the reports and through your investigation that uh, Shumpert was the one who was hands-on assisting <coughs> the medical examiner right down here <coughs> at the body. For an extended period of time. Okay. And you're aware that he just smelled a diaper. You're aware he just smelled a diaper. A dirty diaper. Okay. And as the CSI guy, that's kind of what he does. He responds to scene, responds to scenes, and collects evidence and assists the uh, uh, medical examiner, whatever's needed to be done. He does. And you're aware also from your investigation and from the reports that uh, Shepard actually leaned into the car to take some photographs right there on the scene. Objection, Judge. That's mischaracterizing the evidence what he testified to and it's hearsay. Uh, as far as leaning in the car, I believe that's not what he testified to. A, and B, it's hearsay commenting about what somebody else has testified to and their previous statement. It's not hearsay. It's already in evidence. Uh, he's the lead investigator and he either, he either knows it or he doesn't know it. That's the same objection. Do you aware that he took photographs? I'm aware he took photographs. You took aware that he took photographs of the interior of the vehicle? Yes. And you agree that um, CSI Shumper, uh, he didn't report smelling any odor of decomposition or death or anything of that nature, did he? No, I do not remember talking to him about that. Okay, you're the lead investigator. Yes. And you just don't remember talking to him about it? Not about smelling them. Okay. <clears throat> have, you, have you had a chance to review the crime scene log? I have. All right. So you know there were uh, numerous other people on the scene, Fireman Michael Beekman? I'd have to see the, the log, sir. Okay. For specific things. I just have one moment to find it. Uh, the state has it in evidence. I'd like to get the original crime scene log if I could, please. Um, Shipped to him earlier today. Did everything the state said. I'd like to go upstairs and get it. Yeah, it's in discovery. I'll call the original one. Okay. Y'all keep looking for that. 
please. All right, so you're aware that fire was on the scene? Yes, sir. You just don't know who the individuals are? I don't remember their names, sir, no. All right. And you're aware that none of the firemen responding to the scene uh, reported any other? I don't think it was written down anywhere that they reported no. Well, in fact, the firemen actually denied, specifically denied. Judge, the now I'm going to object to hearsay about what the other people testified to. There's a lot to go into in detail about where they were standing, things like that. It's absolute hearsay. Any right, you're aware there were two um, EMS personnel that were uh, responding, including um, Barwick, who's previously testified, and uh, Mr. Thurlow. Once again, I know EMS responded to the scene. I don't have their names in front of me. All right. And are you aware either of them reported smelling any odor? I've not seen a report of odor on any of their reports. Okay. You had uh, two officers on the scene uh, who were giving life-saving uh, uh, measures, uh, Yalamore and Folia. And they would have been right, right in this area if they were over Cooper's body, right? Correct. And you've spoken with them. I have. You've seen their reports. I have. You certainly agree there's no objection hearsay. Again, okay. asking what another witness told them or what was in their reports. Again, these witnesses are here subject to cross-examination. Um, Judge, these people have already testified, and he's the lead investigator. This is all part of his investigation, information that he has received during his investigation. This, this is all perfectly legitimate uh, cross-examination. Judge, there's no lead detective uh, exception to hearsay. Yes, ma'am. So Folia was there, Piper was there, Gallimore was there. True? Yes, Officer Gallimore, Officer Piper, Officer Folia. Mm -hmm. And there was a fellow helper named Anthony Pantano. Mr. Pantano was there. And there was a guy named James Hawkins. Mr. Hawkins was there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hawkins assisted uh, with CPR. Yes. And he's the one that sort of skedaddled as soon as the police got there. And by skedaddled, you mean left the scene? Yes. Okay. And there was um, a medical examiner investigator Martin Jackson was there, <coughs> correct? Correct. <coughs> and you would agree that um, Martin Jackson was assisting uh, Shumper. Shumper was assisting Martin Jackson right here in this area. Yes, sir. Right over uh, Cooper's body. In fact, manipulating Cooper's body. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, within 36 inches or so of the, the open car. That's correct. I'm just going to mark it this way. That was 74, that was 75. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, take it 
I'm going to hand you what has been marked as Defense Exhibit 74 and Defense Exhibit 75. This is my favorite. I'm just going to give you that packaging and see if you can identify those. Yes, sir. All right. And what is 74 and 75? 74 is a handwritten, it appears to be the crime scene log. Um, Detective K. Jones placed it into evidence. Okay. And this is a typed, um, it appears to be the same log. And they appear to be the same thing? They, they appear to be, and there could be some. I've not gone through line by line, but they appear to be the same thing. All right. And uh, that's, that's part of your case file? Yes, the typed one is, yes. Okay, I'm going to move 74 and 75. Uh, just a couple of questions of what here, Judge. About the, uh, Detective Stoddard, did, did you actually have anything to do with the creation of the crime scene log? I did not. Uh, can you vouch for the accuracy or inaccuracy of it whatsoever? I cannot. Okay, because it's something you do have in your case file. It's something where I had the hard copy was emailed to me, mm -hmm. and um, I believe it was emailed, I'm sorry, and placed into the case file. Okay, I, I don't have any objection, Judge. All right, and the individuals that uh, I've just been questioning you about, you agree that they all, their names appear there on the log? Yeah, um, Officer Galmar, Officer Folia, Officer Piper. Do you see a Beekman and Ashurst from Cop Fire? Yeah, Fireman M. Beekman and Fireman A. Ashurst. And a Barwick and Thurlow from EMS? Yep, Metro Ambulance Paramedic S. Thurlow and Metro Ambulance Paramedic do you see an Anthony Pantano on there? Witness A. Pantano, correct. All right. Do you see James Hawkins on there? I do not see Mr. Hawkins on here. Okay. Well, could it be because he's the one who left out of it? Yes. Okay. Do you see a Martin Jackson on there? Yes, I do. Because a medical examiner's office. And you see that Martin Jackson and Shumpert were there at the same time. They arrived at the same time or on the scene at the same time? Mm -hmm. Which one? And they left, well, they overlapped and they, they left about the same time as well. Yeah, it's like 10 minutes difference. Okay. Yeah, Shumpert, Detective B. Shumpert got there 1721 hours and uh, Mark Jackson got there 1750 hours. All right. Now during your investigation you made inquiry uh, you tried to learn if anybody uh, anybody else had smelled an odor like you did which you which you testified previously it was decomposition and death. Correct. And during your investigation did you learn that anybody else had uh, reported such an odor? Yes. Who was that? Um, CST Grimstead. Anybody else? Um, Ted Farrell. Okay. And you? Captain Farrell, man. All right. So it was you and your boss at the time and CSI Grimstead. And I believe Martin Jackson said something about an odor mm -hmm. also. What did he say? I don't have his testimony in front of me, sir. I believe he said something about an odor. your recollection if uh, I told you that he reported an odor of urine. Okay. Does that refresh your recollection? I don't remember the whole testimony, but I believe that was part of it. And um, Martin Jackson, you know him, don't you? I do. Okay. Uh, Martin Jackson um, has got sort of a lengthy career in the um, in the death and crime scene business, right? He does. I mean, he grew up working in um, funeral homes. Correct. He's got a lot of training. Correct. And what he does for um, the, the medical examiner uh, is he's the on-scene guy. He responds where there has been where there has been a death. Correct. <clears throat> and your recollection is what he reported was that he smelled urine. One part of it, yes. What was the other part? Well, I don't know. I don't have his testimony in front of me. Okay. The 
you recall specifically that certainly you and your boss, Farrell, and Grimstead, three of you recorded smelling an odor uh, associated with death. Correct. Well, once again, I'm not going to say exactly what they said. It was a follow order. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly. I, I didn't see Lieutenant Farrell's or Captain Farrell's, I'm sorry, okay. testimony. Um, I know that when we saw, I don't remember all the Detective Grimstead's testimony. So they did smell something. All right. I will say that. Well, let, let, me, uh, let me ask you, do you recall exactly when CSI Grimstead reported that he, he smelled an odor associated with that? I do not. Is it possible that it was a year after Cooper's passing? And by reported, you mean? Filed a written report. Yes. Do you recall any sort of uh, meeting between you and Lieutenant Farrell and Detective Grimstead about this issue? I remember Captain Farrell being there. Uh, I do remember talking to Detective Grimstead about that. Confirmation bias is? I do not. Have you ever been, been trained in confirmation bias? Objection, ask and answer. He asked if he knew what it was, he said no. I'm sorry, Judge, but this period doesn't go back. No, he was latitude for that. If, if you've not been trained in it, then I can't ask you about it. You don't know what it is? No. Inasmuch as it was only the uh, three of you that reported uh, some sort of odor uh, associated with death, uh, isn't it possible? Judge, I'm going to clarify. Does he mean on the, the body? The where is he talking about the smell? I'm going to object that the question be more specific. I think it's, it's not directed. He has the wrong question. Everybody has a different sense of smell, don't they? That's correct. And we're just going to assume y'all smelled exactly what you recorded. Okay? Isn't it possible that Ross did not smell that? Of course it's possible. Okay. Thank you. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the phone calls to Little Aprons. Um, you testified about that a little bit yesterday. Yes, sir. And we, and we got into evidence. Is that, uh, you remember what 647 was? It appears to be the call on extraction from the iPhone. you what's been marked as defendant's exhibit 72 uh, and see if you can match that up and just for purposes of making your testimony a little bit easier see if see if you can identify that
similar. Well, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. Okay. Have you ever reviewed the call log before? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I've handed you is an extraction report from y'all's piece of evidence, and um, if there's some something markedly different, we don't have to stop the court and get to the bottom of it, but I'm just asking if you can identify the phone log which y'all put into evidence through, that's a cutaway from it, from the extraction report. Yeah, but it's, why is it cut off? What I've handed you, Detective, does that appear to be the call log from Ross's phone on the 18th of June, 2014? It's reordered, but it appears to be the same call. I don't know why it's, it's not ordered the same way. Okay. The numbers don't match up, but it appears to be. All right, I'll move 427. No objection. Okay. All right, look, uh, if you would, please, to the call uh, at 4. 25 and 20 seconds. Okay. Now this is, I'm, what I'm drawing your attention to is a phone call made from Ross's phone at 4.25 and 20 seconds on June the 18th. Do you see that? I see it. <coughs> Does it show where that call was made to? It shows who, it looks like the main de um, Home Depot culprit. Okay. And you recognize that as the number that you looked at that brings back to Little Lake. This is the main number that it brings to the Home Depot, and it goes through a switchboard, and then you have to add the numbers to it. It, will, it does not show up on your log. It has to go to a switchboard? It goes into the main, and then you type in more numbers to get to Tyler Room 5. So it's, it's like calling it, but it's like, you know, what directory or what, I don't know the exact wording, but it's like if you want such and such a person, or such and such a place, type in these numbers, and you add those numbers. In fact, that's consistent with the photograph that was put into evidence earlier of Ross's phone. It actually says Home Depot, correct? The number he called? I don't recall, but this number, the 8211, is the Home Depot number. What happens if you don't put you, punch in those additional numbers? I don't know. I think you just kind of sit there. Kind of sit there. Look at the call at 42557. See that? I do. And where was that call to? That call at 42557 was also to the Home Depot. Switchboard number? It is. So you would agree that uh, that's essentially the same thing. If you don't punch in those additional numbers, the phone call just kind of sits there. Correct. That call lasted five minutes and 13 seconds, correct? That is correct. Now, if we do the math, mm -hmm. Uh, and if the call originated at 4, 25, 57, mm -hmm. and that call lasted 5 minutes, 13 seconds, 
And that call lasted until 4.31.10. You see that? I do. Have I done the math correctly to take this? I believe so. Set that aside for a second. You interviewed Michelle Gray twice about these phone calls, correct? That's correct. And uh, as we've heard, you, you actually met with her downtown in a lawyer's office. We did. Uh, and, and, and in fairness, confronted her rather directly about whether or not she was on the phone with Ross. She was. <coughs> in fact, this is a matter that you testified to previously before magistrates. Yes. And seeking warrants. And you warned her that it could be a crime if she was making a false statement. I did. Okay. And she hasn't been charged with anything, has she? She has not. And you don't have any evidence that Ross ever spoke to Michelle Gray? We have no direct evidence. We have evidence that the call was stripped to the toddler room but we don't have any evidence that she spoke with him, that it was her that spoke to him. Kathy Gordon at Cobb Communication. Do you know who Kathy Gordon is? Yes, I do. Okay. So I've marked it Defendant's Exhibit 73. Okay. And see if that looks like the CAD report, which is already in evidence to the state's exhibit. It does appear so. Move 73. I don't know if that exact document's in, Judge, but we don't we don't have any objection. <clears throat> I want you to take a look at the CAD report for 42704. Okay. What does it say was reported at 42704? 162704, 3315, one detained. Say again, I'm sorry. 3315, one detained. One detained? One detained. What does that mean? In handcuffs in the car. So at 42704, it's, being, it's already being reported that we've got one handcuffed in a car detained. Correct. So you would agree that if um, if Ross was in custody and it was being reported he was in custody at 42704, he'd been in custody several minutes during that phone call which ended at 43110. No, I wouldn't agree with that. When someone is arrested and detained, mm -hmm. um, that it, it, that action is ultimately reported back, and that's what we see on the CAD, right? That's correct. Okay. <coughs> and it doesn't happen simultaneously, does it? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Okay. And sometimes what happens is the officer deals with the event, whatever it is they're doing, handcuffing someone, responding in whatever way. Once they get somebody in the car, get a break in the action, they immediately report in. Or as soon as possible, they report in. Which is also true. Okay. Here, Co 
Cobb County 911 CAD shows reporting in at 42704. He was already in custody, detained, handcuffed in the back of the car. Detective, isn't it possible that what, what really happened when they were fumbling for the phone is that they get redialed on the number that you had just called a moment earlier? Well, that is possible. <clears throat> you learned during your investigation in speaking with Ross um, that he was um, trying to reach uh, Little Aprons at some point during that chaos on the scene? Yes. Um, and what he explained to you was, and what you learned was, he knew that she was going to be there. <coughs> and he sort of wanted to head it off. Is that fair to say? Yes. And in fact, when we look at his phone log, he got, the, he got the calls flipped. He, he actually dialed Leanna, or at some point in time, Leanna was called previously to call him Little Aprons? Yes. And when he told you that, he, he had it flipped. He said he called Little Aprons first and then called him. That's correct. Looking at the log, we know he got that wrong, right? Yes. But we know he was right, and he was telling you the truth when he said he was trying to reach Little Aprons. Correct. We got a 26 second call, and then we got a call that lasted for minutes. Apparently with nobody, not talking to anybody. Fair to say? It's fair to say I don't know who answered the phone, or, <clears throat> but yeah, it's fair to say. And certainly, that scenario would be consistent with someone who was in absolute panic at the time trying to reach their dad, or trying to reach, reach Little Aprons to head her off. That is a possibility. Okay. You interviewed Wesley Houston in this case? Security guard, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes. He never told you that Ross announced that he was going to a movie, did he? I don't recall the entire conversation. You recall that part of it? I recall that, no. Okay. He never told you that he was going to meet Winston Mill Mullins, did he? I don't recall that part. <clears throat> he never told you Ross was making a public service announcement while he was leaving the building, did he? I don't recall those two. See Wesley Houston when he was going to testify? Most of it. Okay. Well, I'm not going to say that. It's all part of it. I'll say part, I believe most of it. Okay. Um, had you had a chance to review his recording before he, before he testified? No, I have not. Okay. It was a very short interview, wasn't it? It was. Did you have a chance to meet with him before he testified? I did not. Um, you interviewed him that was about a month after Cooper's death, roughly? I'd have to look at my okay. If I told you it was July the 16th, does that sound about right? It could be, yes. Okay. Um, but what he did tell you was that when Leanna came in, she told him her husband's name was Ross Harris. Isn't that true? Once again, sir, I'd have to look at the, my report. Do you recall that what Mr. Houston told you was that um, Leanna was the one that gave him the information that Ross was supposed to be going to a movie with a guy named Winston Mullins? Once again, sir, if I could review it and supplement, okay. I'd be able to answer that. All right, well, I'll tell you what. Do you have 
have some kind of lunch plan that would prevent you from listening to that, that 10 minute interview during our break? No. All right. Um, if you don't want to, if you would do that for me, I would appreciate it, and I'll, I'll come back to that, okay? setting a few things up. I want to ask you about that area in the treehouse where um, Wesley Houston would sit and where we saw videos of, of Ross come coming in and out of that, yes, sir. that, that area. There are, there are monitors and screens right there in that little security area, aren't there? There are. And those monitors and screens um, anybody that's walking, anybody that's walking through that area, um, certainly if you worked there, you walk back and forth there every day, you would be able to see those, and you could tell that those screens are there. That's correct. And those screens show the parking lot, don't they? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Some of them show the parking lot. Some of them show the interior of the building. I believe so. Okay. So anybody that works there that comes back and forth across there every day. Um, they will be able to, to, to see that that parking lot is being surveilled. Very possible. All right. Bottom line is, you, you certainly would agree, Ross, ha Ross Harris has every reason in the world to know and understand that that, that parking lot is being monitored and, and surveilled by cameras. Correct. All right. I want to ask you to just uh, step down here just for a sec. I promise to not keep you on your feet too long. All right, so what I'm showing you is what's been admitted is the Defense Exhibit 35. I know you've seen this a million times, Detective. If you could just uh, orient yourself, you know what we're looking at. Yep, this is the tree house. All right, and if you would please point to the area where Ross was parked that day. Uh, what day? On June the 18th. On June 18th, he would have been parked. Right here. Okay, right where the little red sticker is. Yes, sir. All right. And you would agree that um, uh, what we saw through the videos is that, <coughs> I'm going to step behind you, okay, uh, is that Ross comes in off the road and he comes around this way and he does a little three point maneuver and pulls straight into that parking spot, correct? Yeah, it, it either we, we don't have the video showing this side. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have come this way, but you're correct in that he comes around and he does a little maneuver to park right here. Okay. Um, and you recall that on that day, uh, these parking spaces were pretty much full up, weren't they? Correct. Right. Now, mm -hmm. did, you, did you happen to notice parking spaces on the perimeter? Once again, we don't have video showing mm -hmm. right here. There's a possibility that they're shown, but once again, video, there's no video of that section that I've seen. Right. But there is very clear video of the wood line right here, isn't there? There is. Right. Do you agree that what we see is that there are uh, at least two parking spaces available uh, on this wood line, directly in back of where Ross parked? Correct. Right. And you would agree that um, if, uh, if Ross were inclined, put his car somewhere where nobody was going to walk behind it. And nobody was going to be able to look into the back window straight on to a rear-facing car seat. You would agree that Ross could have very easily just backed in to one of the wood line spots. Yeah, when Ross pulls up, or the defendant, I'm sorry, pulls up, he does back up and he backs up in between two cars. So he does come back and he could have kept going and backed up against the wood line. But he chose to drive forward. You, you agree with what I'm saying, though? If he were inclined to put his car in a place where nobody could walk behind it, mm -hmm. to where they could look into the back window straight onto that forward face, that rear facing car seat. Yes, sir. He had the opportunity to do that and park in one of these spaces. He certainly did. Okay. And he didn't do that, did he? Nope. Okay. He pulled forward after backing up. He pulled forward right into that space. Thank you. Yes, sir.
let's uh, take it, if it's okay, let's you and I sort of, if you'll, you'll stand over there as long as you can see. Can you, can you see okay here? I'm sorry. I just want the jury to be able to see. So if, if there's anybody that can't see as we're going through this, if you just wave and we'll readjust. see more or less from here. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, do you recall testifying as to what time Ross parked the morning of the 18th? Around, you tell him parking here? Around 9.25. Yeah, sure. I got the exact time. So around 9.25 in the morning. Okay. 925-ish. Ish. All right. <coughs> As part of the investigation, mm -hmm. you obtained videos of the parking lot uh, from a couple of different cameras, correct? Correct. Uh, and it included the entirety of the day of June the 18th. It did. Okay. Did you review those videos? I did. Did you review the entire day? I did. Good. I want to show you what exhibit number is this, Mr. Munson? Okay, this is States 372. Okay. Uh, and what we're looking at here is labeled uh, 2600. That's the building, the treehouse. Correct. Parking, front, lot, left. Correct. Okay. So we're at time 9.30.55. And do you see where Mr. Harris's truck is? I do. All right. There's, there's a little bit of a glare from my vantage point. Can you point to it, please? Thank you very much. All right. So the time is 9.30 and 55 seconds. Right. Um, Mr. Lumpkin, if you could please uh, let's play for um, a moment, uh, about two minutes, please. See that lady that just walked right by? Yes. Stop that, please. Uh, back, that, back that up just, just a tad. Lady walking there? Yes, sir. Keep playing. All right, stop. Stop it. All right. I see this lady right here. Okay. Oh, one right here. Uh huh. Yep. All right. And you agree what we saw is she walked, she came from the back side of Ross's truck and walked right by his driver's side door. That's correct. Okay. And that's at 9 3104. <coughs> And this would have been six minutes ish of uh, Ross getting out of his car, right? Yes. Ish. Okay. Who, who was that lady? We didn't identify her. Okay. Did you attempt to identify her? Yep. We did. Okay. And how did you do that? Tried to go with badge and reports. I had Home Depot go back, but they weren't able to tell me uh, exactly who she was. Okay. I believe that was the person we tried. You believe believe you tried with her? We tried a couple different people to identify them walking through that parking lot. We weren't able to. Okay. All right. Uh, <coughs> jump ahead to about roughly nine minutes thirty four seconds. Now this is the morning. There's people still coming in to yes, work sir. this time of morning, right? There are. Roughly at nine minutes thirty four seconds. <coughs> Get a little more back. There we go. Okay. There we go. All right, just let it run from there. All right, so we're at nine thirty two to forty eight. And I want you to look. In the area of the car at about nine minutes thirty, uh, excuse me, nine thirty four fourteen roughly. Okay. And we can see from from this, uh, the area of the lot that Ross parked in was 
shape. There's deer tree shape. In fact, there's a tree. Oh, there's a tree, but also there could be a little bit of sun sign on there. Okay. But yeah. Did you? Uh, and we can also see these spaces in the back of the lot where he could have parked right back of the wood line. Correct. Yeah. Because when he backed up, I mean, he went past the space. He backs up, and he backs up because he's too tall. So there wasn't space over there. through part of this uh, this video judge and we'll refresh it. So now it's fine. Alright. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take our lunch break. Close your notepads, keep an open mind, don't discuss the matter. It's a time to enjoy each other's company and <coughs> Just watch the step going down. Stand in recess. Everybody have a good lunch. Cheers.